everybody's noticing how social and political conversation has become more and more polarized to the point where you hardly could call it a conversation anymore. It's more of a, a battle. And not only have contentious topics become more polarized than ever, but also more and more topics are, are kind of entering the polarized realm, leaving very little common ground for people to establish civic discourse anymore. I think what makes a topic especially prone to hyperpolarization is if it lends itself to a totalizing discourse. A totalizing discourse means that, that everything can be framed in its terms. So, so, uh, it could, so some examples are um, race, gender, climate change, um, socialism versus capitalism. Um, yeah, anything that, that allows you to organize the entire world into pro and against us and them, and that allows you to take on an identity as one of the good guys. I talk about this a lot now, that allows you to identify with team good and to cast off others into team evil. That lends itself to a polarized conversation. And um, you can see then from that, you can see what the underlying need is. It's the, the need to identify with something, the need to accept oneself as good, as right, as part of the solution, not part of the problem, um, to excuse oneself from feeling guilt, from really feeling the pain of a world that has gone astray, um, to feel okay with yourself and to belong. I mean, I remember, you know, from being on 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 sports teams, you know, in, in high school and college, like the feeling of belonging was so strong, I, I kind of searched for it for the rest of my life. Um, and today, because of the fragmenting of society, because of the erosion of community, because of the breakdown in our unifying story as a civilization and as a culture, people are suffering a huge identity loss. Because, yeah, shorn of their intimate connections to nature, to place, to community, to extended family, and so forth, boxed into these single family, nuclear family units that are utterly disconnected from the land and the people around them. Um, having digitally mediated relationships, there's no sense of belonging that can come from that. No sense of being embedded in a world that is part of you and you're part of it. So those conditions drive um, drive people to, to want to identify with something, to give life meaning again. This is partly a symptom of the larger cultural breakdown in stories in, in our meaning-making capacity, well, our meaning-making um, stories. So here's a substitute. Here's something that gives life meaning again. So really, the polarization of society is a symptom, a symptom of many things. But one of them is the breakdown of our overarching narratives that give life direction and meaning. Here's what I'm a part of. That's the, the basic. We need that. We need a social narrative that gives everybody a feeling of, of, of here's what I am a part of. And... Secondly, the second thing it's a symptom of is the breakdown in, in community and connection to place and, and a feeling of belonging. As long as those conditions persist, I think that intensifying polarization is inevitable, which then becomes a vicious circle. Because it doesn't meet the real need. Ident identity with a polarized in-group doesn't actually meet the need. And so you end up then 
your polarized in-group in ends up splintering in again into the good team and the bad team. And, and you have, you see this today in the, in the left where it's kind of cannibalizing itself. And people who thought that they were liberals and, and identified as progressives are getting called out for uh, insufficient purity in their use of language around race or something like that. And, and so, so you have a, a, a shrinking in-group or a um, bifurcating or multifurcating of an original side of things. Um, and I'll just say, I mean, I could say a lot more about that. Um, what gets sacrificed to the war effort? Because the more that you other the people on the other side of an issue, the more that you dehumanize them, the more that, that winning the fight becomes important, then the more you have to sacrifice everything else to that goal. When winning is the most important thing, then, for example, any data point that comes in that doesn't fit into a weaponized narrative that's going to help you arouse hatred and anger against the other side is going to be a, you're going to be hostile to that data point. You're going to want to exclude it whether or not it's true. So you can see, uh, for example, and okay, so I'm going to get it. So, okay, if I give any examples, I'm going to risk pissing people off because if it doesn't fit into your opinion set, then I become one of the enemy, or worse yet, I'm saying, well, maybe neither side is right. Um, and then I'm a pacifist. If I'm calling for an end to the war, I'm a pacifist. And in times of war, pacifists, I've, I've, said, I've said this in many places, pacifists are more hated than the enemy because the enemy affirms your identity. The pacifist questions it. So. It, if I give an example, then I can very easily become someone on the other side. So if I say, say if I question the Russian collusion narrative that says Hillary Clinton lost the election because Russian bots and Russian trolls poisoned the public mind and got them to vote, got people to vote for Donald Trump or whatever. If I cast doubt on that, then I'm not helping. I'm not helping in the anti-Trump effort because this is a piece of ammunition that could be used. And I'm saying, well, okay, you know, I actually think he's doing horrible things um, with immigration, with the environment, with so many other things. But that part, I don't think so. I don't think that's true. Well, then I'm playing into the hands of the Russians. I'm playing into the hands of the Republicans. I'm playing it because I'm, I'm de-weaponizing a weaponized narrative. So I must be on the other side. So we can see that what gets sacrificed is the truth. And I bet a lot of people who are advancing and rubbing their hands with glee every time a new revelation uh, comes up that seems to support the Russian collusion narrative, they, a lot of them secretly know that it is, in Van Jones' words, a big nothing burger. But they're not going to admit that. They're going to keep that quiet, maybe not even admit that to themselves. It's a, it's a textbook application of doublethink to believe two contra contradictory things at the same time. To I, I wish I could read the quote from Orwell. Um, but in the quest for power, truth must be sacrificed. And the quest for power is justified if you're good, if you're the good guys then anything you do to gain power is by definition good because you're the good guys. This is the logic of the party in 1984. We're going to create a paradise on earth if we have enough power to do so. Therefore, we have to gain more and more power until our power is total. It's a, it's a recipe for totalitarianism, all for the greater good, to quote um, the uh, evil wizard in... Uh, in um, Harry Potter, what was his name? Grindelwald, for the greater good.
to gain total power for the greater good, because we're the good guys. And you can see how this plays out in US foreign policy, where good is identified as American interests. So if somebody is a horrendous, brutal autocracy, say Saudi Arabia, but they're on our side, so they're the good guys. Whereas if you're Venezuela and resisting dollar hegemony and nationalizing your oil, uh, oil fields and not allowing Western investment in it, then you get branded as socialist and anti-American and you're the bad guys. And even if you have a democratic election that was witnessed by international observers, et cetera, et cetera, and deemed fair by many organizations, but you elect the wrong person, then that person is by definition a, a, an evil dictator because he's on the other side. And this is there's a certain naivete here. It's not um, fully conscious, this assignment of Maduro um, to the category of evil. It's of course, don't you understand? We're the good guys. So if he's anti-American, he must be the bad guys. And if something doesn't serve that narrative, it must be rejected. And if you support something, advance a data point that doesn't fit the narrative, you're an enemy. Don't you get it? You're not helping here. You're rendering aid and comfort to the enemy, whether or not it's true. So the filter is not true. The filter is not, is it true? The filter is, does it serve our uh, our goals. And this leads to some deeper philosophical questions, like what is truth actually? Uh, a, a refuge from that question is truth is fact. Truth is what corresponds to objective facts in the world. But in the postmodern age, we recognize the limitations of that understanding of truth.